Ah, I think I forgot my helmet. Did you bring yours? I normally do, but I always have a helmet with me. Welcome back Deep Review TV viewers, Chris Nichols here. And before we get started, I just wanna say that Jordan and I highly advocate the use of bike helmets. We normally wear one. Here's a geeky photo of me to prove that. We're gonna be super careful today though because we are carrying some very precious cargo. Today we're looking at the three high resolution full frame mirrorless cameras on the market. The Sony a7R 3 we've got the Nikon Z7, and we have the very new Panasonic S1R. We are gonna do a cute little bike trip today. That's kind of our theme today. We're gonna ride around the extensive bike paths in Calgary and uh, just tell you the ins and outs of these three cameras across seven categories. In third place, we're giving it to the Sony a7R III. First off, the menu systems are still a little bit archaic, although they are vastly improved over what they used to be. The controls are very customizable, but they generally have a cheaper plasticky feel, not the best touchscreen interface from all the cameras. And although I do like the grip and the smaller body for people who want to keep things compact and travel, the grip is so tight to lenses that often your fingers dig into the side. So overall, it's not the worst camera on the market, but it is the worst of these three. So in second place, we're gonna go with the Panasonic S1R, but this is a very close one, and it really is gonna depend on what you like in a camera. First off, this camera is large and heavy, and that might be a big deal for a lot of people. But I do love the big size, and I think that by far this camera has the best ergonomics as far as dial controls go, customizability, feel of all the dials. It's a solid, rugged body. The only, my only complaints are my nose still hits the touchscreen and moves the point when I don't want it to, and I find that my drive dial here on the left is easy to switch, but those are minor things. It's really gonna come down to, if you're okay with this large body, it might very well be the best camera for you. Our number one prize is gonna go to the Nikon Z7. Even though it's close, this gives you a really nice interface, beautiful menus, I love the grip. It's a fantastic looking camera that really harkens to the SLR designs. I love that the EVF stands far apart from the touchscreen, so you're not bumping your nose into it. It's got an awesome autofocusing joystick. But in the end, it's all about balance. This camera is a great compromise between ruggedness without being overly heavy or large. And so for that reason, when it comes to ergonomics, the Nikon Z7 is what I'm gonna take with me. So in third place, it's gonna be the Sony a7R III here again, and that's really because it's starting to show its age. It's the oldest of the three cameras. Although you do have a 3.69 million dot EVF, the magnification is the lowest of the bunch, and the screen on the back only rotates in two directions. It's nothing to write home about, not super bright, not high res. Second prize easily goes to the Nikon Z7. I love the now over two million dot OLED on the back. It only rotates in two directions, but it's sharp and it's bright. Now the EVF, 3.69 million dots, decent magnification, but again, I really like that it stands apart from the back screen and you don't lose resolution when you're rolling video or focusing. First place is an easy victory for the Panasonic S1R. You're getting the highest res EVF in the industry. It's 120 frame per second refresh rate and just beautiful magnification, plus that eye relief control that it has. And the back screen does give you three directions of articulation, so it beats out the other two. You know, that interface between the human eye and the camera is so important, so I'm taking the Panasonic. I feel like a Disney princess. I know it's more of a Cinderella thing with the birds, but I've always associated more with Rapunzel because of, you know, the great hair and the fact that we both grew up without fathers. Can I just do one category that's not video this time? Just one. But I'm the host of the show though. Come on. It's my birthday this week. Yeah. Just, just one, just one. Okay, but consider this your present for me this year. In last place, it's gotta go to the Nikon Z7. Now, this is a single card slot. Nobody's talking about it, but it is kind of a big deal if you need a backup. Now as well, we're using the old EL15s, a new version that can be USB charged, but unfortunately video really chews through this and it wasn't great battery life for photo as well. It's nice that they're supporting the legacy formats, but single card slot and worst battery life of the batch, this is a definite number three. Panasonic S1R is a big improvement. We're moving over to dual card slots with this and it's my favorite version where you've got XQD and also SD if you want some less expensive media in there. Now this has a big battery and you'd expect this to go all day. And if you're filming, it does a really great job. I've gotten over two hours of runtime on that, 
For photo though, we found it really chews through the batteries. So if you wanna go out all day, you're gonna need a couple batteries. For that reason, Panasonic S1R is number two. Number one, we gotta give it to the Sony a7R III. You've got those dual card slots you've been asking for. Now, we've got a fast UHS-2, but also a slower UHS-1 card slot. Fortunately, that'll also do double duty for all those memory stick cards you've been hanging on to. But the real draw here is that we've got Sony Z battery. You'll get tons of record time if you're shooting video, but also this will let you shoot photos all day. It's very small, very light, and really good life on it. So for that reason, if I need to go out and shoot all day, I'm taking a Sony a7R III. Naturally, third place is gonna to go to the Panasonic S1R. They just haven't been around long enough in this mount to make a bunch of lenses. Now you do have the Leica L mount lenses, but they're crazy expensive. Sigma has announced lenses, but they're not out yet. And the adapter that they do make for Canon EF doesn't support continuous autofocus. Wow, conveniently somebody has left a perfectly good Nikon Z7 and A7R 3 out here on this log for me to play with. Now Nikon's actually impressed us by striking a great balance between expensive but capable professional lenses and accessible, affordable lenses as well in their lens lineup. They also have a very impressive roadmap, which inspires confidence when you're looking at a brand new lens mount. I also love the F-mount adapter. You can often get it provided for free with the kits. It's flawless and it opens up a whole line of F-mount lenses. The only reason why this camera's not number one is because it's a relatively new mount. Ooh. Bike riding is tiring. I do not know how Richard does it over there at Deep Your Views. So pardon me while I recline for this last part. Number one winner, Sony a7R III. I mean, Sony, you gotta give it to them. They've really ignored their APS-C line, but they've absolutely fleshed out their full-frame G Master line and G lenses. They do a great job with beautiful lens formulas. You got a lot of selection. I also love that there's tons of aftermarket support and great adapters out there as well. These guys have had the mount the longest in this game, and that shows they've made the most lenses. This is the winner. I guess I've gotta get up and take it with me. All right. All right, let's talk about autofocus next. Thank you, my one and only fan. Um, so in third place, I'm actually gonna give it to the Nikon Z7. Although autofocus performance is very similar to the Panasonic, and I do like the fact that we have hybrid autofocusing here, I still don't like the implementation of how to engage things like tracking. And this is the only company out of the three that hasn't really incorporated deep learning techniques into their autofocus. I also found that the Panasonic gave us a slightly higher hit rate. In second place, this Panasonic S1R. It slightly beat out the Nikon for hit rate, but it's still not exactly where we want it to be. Also, remember this contrast detect only system means you get a lot of that wobbling, which is very disconcerting. However, this camera has amazing single point autofocus. A lot of people still shoot that way. I like the deep learning animal detect focusing. That's gonna be very handy for wildlife photographers. And it has one of the nicest implementations for setting up your autofocus, button placement to get it going. And that means a lot when you're out in the field. It's no surprise, but the winner is gonna be the Sony a7R III. They've always had the best eye detect system right down to the pupil level. It seamlessly transitions between eye, face, and then full body tracking. This camera now has new deep learning technology implemented in it where it will track faces even better, as well as now animals, and everything is very slick and easy to get set up. So by far, the highest hit rate and success rate, it's gonna be the Sony a7R III. That's why I'm taking it for my autofocusing test. God, I don't know how those guys do the bike tests. It's exhausting. Now I should mention these high res bodies aren't really ideal for video. Don't forget that all of these have lower megapixel versions in their same range. That's probably a better choice if you're gonna be doing a lot of video, but if you want a high res camera that can shoot capable video, number three is gonna be the Sony. We've got a half hour record limit on this camera and it's stuck at eight bit no matter what you do with it. Now it does give you the option to shoot log, but honestly, S-Log3 and HLG I don't find work great until we get ourselves a 10-bit codec. So number three, Sony a7R III. Second place, we got the Nikon Z7. Now this is actually my favorite autofocuser of the three cameras. If you're not gonna be able to manually pull focus, it has an excellent stabilizer on it as well. It is let down though by the terrible preamp if you wanna record audio directly into it. Now in terms of the image quality, it's 8-bit internal, but we've got Nikon's excellent flat profile. It's really easy to grade and gives you a little bit of a dynamic range boost, but if you need more than that, kick this thing out to an external recorder. You're gonna get access to N-Log for a lot more flexibility in post and 10-bit recording. So number two, Nikon Z7. This is a tricky one and a bit subjective because I don't use autofocus in video a lot, but I'm giving it to the Panasonic S1R. 
Now we have the best IBIS out there right now. It's got a great preamp and support for the Panasonic XLR1 adapter, which is my favorite XLR adapter for audio. As well, this is the only camera of the bunch that can shoot 4K 60. You've also got 180 frame per second slow-mo recording, where we're capped at 120 on the other guys. My number one pick for video camera, if you don't need autofocus, Panasonic S1R. Chris gives me cards and batteries to talk about. That's child's play. I need a challenge, so I'm gonna talk about the big one, image quality. Now, before I get going, I should mention all of these give you some of the nicest image quality we've ever seen, but there are some differences that may have a real impact depending on the type of photography that you're doing. Now, at number three, we've got the Nikon Z7, and this is a really nice balance between high ISO performance, good dynamic range throughout, and we love that it has ISO 64, which gives you the highest possible image quality if you've got enough light. However, there is no multi-shot with this. As well, we do see some banding when you push those shadows really heavily. Now, it doesn't happen all the time, but if you're planning to use that ISO 64, maximize your dynamic range, that banding can rear its ugly head and take a little bit away from that. For that reason, it is our number three for image quality. Number two for image quality, we gotta give to the Panasonic S1R. Now, if you're interested in getting as much resolution as possible, this has the best high res mode. Takes eight exposures, gets you nearly 200 megapixel image, and the interface for doing that is really fantastic. As well, because there's no phase detect on the sensor, you're getting no image quality defects like striping if you're shooting backlit scenes. But we can't give this the top prize because it does have the lowest dynamic range of all the cameras at base ISO, and the most noise when you're shooting at high ISO. Picture quality is excellent, but it can't take our top prize. Number one, we gotta give it to the Sony A7R III. Now, it gives you competitive dynamic range at base ISO, but as you start to crank those ISOs up higher and higher, the dynamic range is consistently better than the other two cameras. As well, this is giving us the best high ISO performance regarding image noise. Now, it's not perfect. The multi-shot on it only uses four exposures and you have to build them in post. It's super clunky. And as well, Sony still refuses to give us a lossless compressed raw option. So those files are bigger than they need to be. It's gonna slow your camera down and chew through your hard drives. But at the end of the day, when I need the best image quality, I'm taking the Sony a7R III. So who's the Panasonic for? Well, the autofocus isn't gonna win any awards, but keep in mind that with the IBIS in here, you can easily adopt manual focus lenses and get great performance out of this. On top of that, you're getting an incredibly rugged body, the nicest interface, the nicest displays. I can see this being really well at home with somebody doing studio or landscape photography especially. You got great video here as well, and really, the only downside in this camera, well, you're gonna pay for it. And I don't mean that in a threatening way, I mean literally out of your wallet, it's expensive. So who's the a7R III best gonna be suited for? You gotta keep in mind that the price point here is pretty decent now. You're getting fantastic image quality still, even though the camera is starting to show its age. But with that autofocus capability for shooting portraits, the fact that it's got a lighter, more compact body for travel, and that it's rugged enough with excellent battery life, I think this camera's actually your best all-around performer. You've got good video, good landscape capability, good portrait capability, and so if you're kind of wondering which camera is gonna be best suited for many different tasks, I think the Sony's a great choice. So who should look at buying into the Nikon Z7? It's hard to recommend this to people just coming into the system because although it has a great balance of body design versus ruggedness and weight and ergonomics as well, I still think this is mostly gonna to appeal to people who already have Nikon F glass. The tricky part there is, you also have to think about the Nikon D850, although it's an SLR, it has better image quality and it's got better autofocusing, so a lot of people might go that way. I think the real key thing here is that the Nikon is a great mix of both photography and videography. If you are a Nikon user who has a lot of F lenses and you wanna get into video or more compact body design, this might be your ticket. All right, so we hope that you find these videos useful. And as usual, don't get too hung up on the actual rankings. What we're really trying to accomplish with these videos is to give you a good idea of who these cameras are best suited for. It really comes to what kind of photography you do and whether these cameras will fit into your workflow. Don't forget, check out our Instagram feeds and our Twitter feeds. Comment both on deepreview.com and down below. Please subscribe to the channel. And as usual, we'll see you very soon with some more camera reviews.